Good morning, church family. We trust you well and strong. We're sorry that we are not able to meet again this Sunday together on our church property. But we do trust that we will get over this wave and that we'll be allowed to meet again um, physically in our church building. Won't you please bow your heads with me as we begin this service. Our gracious Heavenly Father and Eternal God, we gather together virtually this morning in your name, surrounded by many blessings, the ones we can see and count and those we can't see. We give you thanks and praise for keeping us safe during these trying times of COVID, financial distress and political instability in our country. Help us, Lord, as we consider your word this morning. Soften our hearts, transform our minds, and guide our steps, that we may walk with you in the manner worthy of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come and we humble ourselves before you this morning, acknowledging that you are loving, faithful, caring, and almighty Father. You are powerful and sovereign God. As we gather together in your name, we are reminded of who you are in our lives. We are surrounded by your blessings, seen and unseen. We give you praise and thanks. Father, we are sinners by nature. We acknowledge our constant failure to measure up to your will by obedience to your word, and we ask for your forgiveness in Jesus' name. We have been saved by your measureless grace, love, and mercy. Our heart rejoice and we worship and praise you, for in your great mercy you have given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance kept in heaven for us, who through faith are shielded by your power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Father, may you help us by your Spirit to continue steadfast in our walk, to be constant in prayer, and constant in our desire for your glory and honor. Merciful Lord, we bring before you all those who are in need, all those who are in any way afflicted and distressed. Lord, you know the world is struggling with this pandemic, crime, abuse, corruption, unemployment, and hunger, and many other sufferings. Father, you are in control of every situation and you rule over all the nations of the world. People are constantly in need of your love, comfort, strength and hope and protection to face all the challenges they are facing right now. Father, you know each one and we pray you would grant them patience in their suffering that you would comfort and deliver them according to their different needs. Father, we pray for the salvation of the state president and all in authority, that you would grant them wisdom and strength to know and to do your will. We pray you would fill them with the love of truth, justice and righteousness, that they may save your people faithfully and to honor you. We pray that you would fill them with the love of truth, justice and righteousness, that they may serve your people faithfully to your honor and glory. Father, we pray that you would continue to guide our bishops and other ministers and all congregations of our church in this present time, that you would give them hope in this hopeless situation, that you would refresh them and bless them continually not to give up, but that they may truly serve and please you. 
to the praise of our Lord Jesus Christ. We lift Jomo and us as a family before you. We pray for strength, wisdom, support, and encouragement. We pray that we as a congregation would always be an encouragement to one another as we continue to serve and honor you. We pray you would bless our endeavors, our church council, Bible study leaders, our youth teacher, and our Sunday school teachers. We ask all these things in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. The passage we're reading is taken from Acts 10, verses 1 to 23. Cornelius calls for Peter. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon, the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of, the, one of his attendants. He told them everything that happened and sent them to Joppa. We continue with the reading. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius, a centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man. He is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to make you come to his house, so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guests. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, as we gather around God's word, it has been an incredible privilege that in spite of all the limitations, we still have been managed to meet together. And particularly great that this service we're able to bring to you as a church family. We've been away, back, and we recorded this for your service. It brings about new ideas. And I hope it will challenge you as you think about the passage we're looking at this morning. Acts chapter 10. Really, we're looking at the whole passage, but the girls only read the first two sections of this passage just because the passage is that long. And this morning, we're looking at the subject of change. Change is inevitable. And I'm sure you've heard that many, many times before. Change is always there, changing. People change, season change, music styles change, technology changes rapidly, times change, cultures change, everything changes. Think about your own life. Your income has changed over the time. Your financial needs have changed over the time. If you are married, your marriage has changed over time. Everything 
around us, change everything. Nothing remains the same forever. Yet so many of us resist change. We don't want to change. We don't want to see change. We want things to remain the same all the time. And when it comes to church, change is a real enemy. The church doesn't like to change. It is an amazing thing that you'd find in many suburbs, churches that serve community members who don't even live in the area because they don't want to change. Many Christians don't like to change. Think about it in our own church fellowship. The things that we've had to change and how uncomfortable some of you have been because of all those changes. Not only just now, over the years, Christ Church Hillcrest has changed. Remember the church building used to have pews. And for many people, they were very upset when those pews were replaced by very comfortable chairs. You think about the hymn books. So many people were very upset when we moved from that to overhead projectors and today to the digital projectors. And people were not comfortable with it. When you read church history, you find exactly the same thing. The church was so against the introduction of guitars and drums in the church music. They just wanted the piano alone. Everything. And some churches, they've got wooden crosses on their walls, and those are so holy that no one is allowed to touch them. And some people even argue that real preachers read from the Bible, not from iPads. Because all this change is resisted. We would rather remain exactly the same as we've been in the last hundred years. But well, change is constant. Change is a fact of life. Change is a law of life. Everything changes. But why we as a church resist change so much? Could it be that our understanding that God is the same, he never changes the reason why we don't want to change? Is it because the Bible tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? And because he is the same, he doesn't change, we too must not change. And if that's your conviction, it's a theologically incorrect interpret interpretation of that passage. God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. But the way he deals with people in different times of life changes all the time. In fact, the whole Christianity is about change. When you mention the name Jesus next to it, there must be the word change. Jesus is about change. The whole Christian Life is just about change, changing lives, changing the way we think, changing the way we behave, changing the way we deal with people, changing the way we view money, changing everything. It's a whole worldview change. Jesus is about change, saving sinners from hell and growing believers in grace. It is true that indeed God is constant. He doesn't change. But he, the way he deals with people changes all the time, depending on the context. The way Peter was converted is different to the way Paul was converted. The way both of them grew and matured in Christ was different because God treated them differently. Even the passage we're looking at this morning it was about Peter, who was already a Christian, a converted man, but God still wanted him to change some of his views and attitudes toward other people. That's X10. That's where we are. It is a great example. Peter was a bold preacher. He was a gospel man. And we also told of a man called Cornelius, the Roman centurion, 
He was a God-fearing man. So in other words, he was a believer already. And so this passage tells us that God wanted these two men and the people who were with them to come together because he was to bring about new things. There is no question about their faith. There is no question about their faith, faithfulness. And there is no question about their commitment. Yet God brought them together because he wanted to make some adjustments in their lives. So let's look at it. The first section is verse 1 to 8. Cornelius' vision. One day we told that Cornelius had a vision from God and God told him to send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. By all accounts, Cornelius had never met Peter. Probably he didn't know Peter. That's why God gives him so much description about Peter. And indeed, this man obeyed God and sent this man down to Joppa. Peter, on the other side, had a different vision. While he was praying on the roof deck, he became hungry, but lunch wasn't ready yet. And he continued to pray, and the Bible tells us that he fell asleep. Now, listen to the vision that Peter had from verse 11 to 17. I'm going to read that. He saw heaven open and something like a large ship being led down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the man sent by Cornelius arrived at the gate. Now with that the Bible also tells us that the Holy Spirit commanded Peter to go down, meet these men, and accept their invitation. So you can see already in this vision that God is directing Peter to a different life, to a different thing. It was not clear to Peter why Cornelius wanted to meet him, and it is clear that Peter had not met Cornelius. Now, what is God doing here? That becomes clear in the section that the girls didn't read from verses 23 to 48, that long section, because it is there where Peter and Cornelius meet. But before we get there, I want you to pause for a moment and think about this situation. Peter didn't know Cornelius. Cornelius didn't know Peter. Peter was a Jew. Cornelius was a Gentile. And under normal circumstances, these two men had nothing in common. In fact, humanly speaking, Peter was not supposed to go to Cornelius' house. He was supposed to decline the invitation. And Peter makes this very, very clear. In the passage, you can see it in verse 28. He says he was, he was not supposed to come. But also his fellow Jewish leaders in Jerusalem would not approve of this invitation. A rabbi wasn't supposed to go to a God-fearing man's home who was a gentle and have a meal with. There were a whole issue of religious cleanliness that was involved there. But Peter had a vision and the Holy Spirit had told Peter to accept the invitation. In the vision, God had shown Peter things that under normal circumstances, Jewish people wouldn't eat. And the Holy Spirit says to Peter, 
God has made it clean. Eat it. What now? What must Peter do? What on earth is God doing with these men? Remember, at this point in the history of Christianity, it was very much around the Jewish community. Gentiles were just God-fearing believers. And when Peter is invited by a Gentile, and the Gentile tells him that God spoke to him, that on its own was something new. But he invited, he accepted the invitation, and he went to meet him. And he went with his men who were with him, together with the people that Cornelius had sent. And Cornelius on the other side had invited few of his neighbors to come and be part of this gathering because the man of God was coming. The apostle was going to be in the house of an Italian general. And as they met, you read the passage, Peter asked, why am I here? The, Cornelius repeats the story of the vision and Peter understands that link between that vision and his vision and why God had brought him there. Something new, something that would change their lives forever. And it wasn't primarily about salvation. But it was about change of attitude toward other people. You see, the gospel belongs to all. And God accepts all people. And this was not clear yet in Peter's mind. Until he began to speak in verse 34 and 35. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accept from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. For the first time, I now understand that really God does not show favoritism. The lights came on and Peter could see what he couldn't see before. And he makes a big confession here. I have been preaching the gospel. I have seen many people come to faith but I have never thought that God would accept the Gentiles the same way he accepts the Jews. It's something new. That in the kingdom of God, there are no Jews and Gentiles, but the children of God. And again, while he was still, still talking, while he was still amazed by what was happening in Cornelius' house, he was interrupted. Have a look at verse 44 and 45. While he was busy talking, the Holy Spirit came down. It came on all who had the message. The people who were there received the Holy Spirit. The Jewish believer who had come with Peter were astonished, the Bible tells us that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Everybody who was there was surprised to see this. And suddenly Gentiles spoke in tongues. Gentiles began to manifest the power of the Holy Spirit that the Jewish people thought was exclusively theirs. Again, it was a clear message to all. God is on the mission to save both Jews and Gentiles. God was changing lives. God was changing lives one at a time. He was helping people to connect with his mission, both Gentiles and Jews. And at the same time, those people who were there had to see clearly that God's mission is about salvation. He was changing lives. He was changing believers' attitude. Peter's attitude towards the Gentiles had to change if the gospel was to spread. 
And already God in Christ had called Peter, um, had already called Paul to save the Gentiles. But Peter still had issues that needed to change. And what a way to change him. What a way. He was changing his attitude towards them. From now on, Peter would treat Gentiles different. And the baptism of Cornelius and other Gentiles gives witness to the change that took place in Peter's heart. You see, change is all that God is committed to. He wants your heart to be transformed. He wants your mind to be renewed. And because when your mind and your heart are changed, behavior follows. It is our change towards God, the way we view him, the way we treat him. If we change and we become reconciled with him, that change would then manifest itself in the way we treat other people, other believers, and other non-believers. This experience changed Peter's life. From now on, I think Peter would begin to learn to know people's names. They would not just be the brothers, the God-fearing Gentiles, but they would be Cornelius, the centurion, a godly man. A godly man who was acknowledged by God to be so godly. He was generous. He was faithful in prayer. And God acknowledged that. And yet Peter struggled to acknowledge. And now he will. He would even learn to eat some of their food. I mean, this was a real challenge for Peter. And I think it is for many of you. Think about it. You, 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 you're a white South African uh, living up in the leafy suburbs of Cliff, Hillcrest, other areas around where we serve the community, and you get invited by your Christian brother in the valley, and you get there, and they offer you chicken feet, chicken hair. It will take a while to enjoy that meal. But if we see them as our brothers and sisters in Christ, you will do it. You will learn to do it. Cross-cultural ministry teaches so many things. It helps us to appreciate other people's cultures, other people's meals, other people's dress codes. Instead of looking down on them, we begin to appreciate what's different. It doesn't scare us. It helps us to embrace diversity. And that's what Peter had to learn here. He would open up his home. A Jewish rabbi opening his home to a gentle general. Think about it. Think about Peter inviting Cornelius to his house for a meal. God was doing something new. Lives were being changed left, right and center. So, this passage, what does it teach us? It reminds us that God had changed their world as they knew it, and that Christ continued to change them, even though they had become believers, but he continued to change them because he wanted them to connect with his mission. Jesus meant change them. And lots of change. And the good news is that Jesus still means change today. Lots of change. He is encouraging and challenging us to embrace this change. To celebrate the things that he's doing in our lives. We as Christians have to come to grip with this change. When Jesus died on the cross... He dealt with our sins and he brought us new life. He, he, he started a new relationship with us, relationship that changed our world view. His death on the cross brought us life. 
And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, God is calling us to step forward in faith, to partner with him as he continues to reach people, people of different races, people of different cultures, people of different social class. And he wants us to change our views so that we can minister to them. God is calling us to change our ways and our thoughts. Yes, indeed, God's way of doing this may sometimes look unreasonable or unclean, like the food that was delivered to Peter. Unclean. Like this virtual church thing. This is a huge change that on Sunday morning we sit in the comfort of our homes, watch the TV while we are at church. See, this change is forced upon us. And yet God is using this to still reach many sons and daughters with the gospel, to encourage many who are discouraged, to call us to prayer, to reading of his word, and to challenging other people around us. Think about attending Bible study on Zoom. It's a huge change. So many people have just said we are not attending Bible study until we are able to gather together again because we are not doing this Zoom thing. You see, that is resistance to change. God is using those times when we are together on Zoom and learning his word. He is inspiring us. He's challenging us. He's teaching us. He's transforming us. He's renewing our hearts Embrace change and join a Bible study on Zoom. What about praying with strangers at work? When someone is going through a rough time, for you to say, I don't have answers to your challenges, but I know one who does. Would you mind if we pray together? If you've never done that, this could be the beginning of your ministry. Praying with people at work. Opening your home for ministry. Because the time will come when we'll be allowed to gather and to invite friends to our home for a meal. Just to be able to do that deliberately seeking to reach people for Christ. God wants us to change. I hope you get the point here. It is an amazing thing what God is doing at a moment, during difficult times of COVID, God is still saving people. Many people who didn't even want to hear anything about God are now open to hear about God. And yet we are not allowed to gather together to tell them. And yet we're using this technology to do just that. Jesus is about change. Christianity is about change. And as Christians... We should embrace change. Our churches should celebrate change. God is currently saving lives through these online ministries. We've become a virtual community. The question is, how are you responding to this change? Are you asking God, what is it, Lord, that you are teaching me at this point in time? What is it that you want me to change? What is it that you want me to embrace? What is it that you want me to start? And how can I be of service to you? Teach me a new thing. Peter was a believer. He was a Christian. But he had a wrong attitude towards the Gentiles. And God wanted to bring that to an end. And you might have been a Christian for a long, long time and you've got issues with people of other races. And God wants you to change that. Because you will never be able to reflect his love, his mercy, his kindness to people of other races if you have racist attitudes. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it is your wrong view of this world. 
that you dedicated so much of your time and your energy to this world as if that it is all there is to it. And you forget that one day the Lord will call you home. And God says to you this morning through Christ, you must change that. Maybe he wants you to change your view towards your money. Maybe he wants you to change your view towards your church. Maybe he wants you to change your view towards your colleagues at work. Maybe you're the one he wants to bring the gospel to them through. And if you are not willing and open to the idea of sharing the gospel with them, who will? And God wants you to change. What is God asking you to change this morning? Are you willing to obey? Let's pray together. Father, we confess that often our attitudes toward other people are not consistent with the gospel. We confess that our willfulness and our hearts often are not consistent with the gospel. Lord, forgive us and grant us true repentance. Guide us and strengthen us. For we are often lukewarm and stubborn and love to stick with our culture, even when our culture is not in line with the gospel. Grant us to know your will, to obey your will, and to apply it in our lives. Father, we know that your presence alone can make us holy, constant, strong, and faithful. For in you we live and move and have our beings. And apart from you, we are but dust. Father, in the words of the old hymn, we ask that you change our hearts this morning. Make them ever true. May we be like you. You are the porter. We are the clay. Mold us and make us. This is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen.